Hi, this is Dr. Michael Timms, and I wanted to uh, thank you for being here. I'm going to talk to you about uh, design and development of two assisted research studies. And um, I want to ask you first, though, are you curious about how bicycles work? What about why there are both left and right handed people? Or why yawning is contagious? I'm going to leave you with those curiosities and come back to them a little bit later. So what we're going to cover is the things to consider before you begin these research projects. Two, um, I'm going to go over two projects, their challenges and their outcomes, and then try to summarize some of the best practices that I've learned from the point of view of faculty and the students. So before you begin, Really, I think you have to start with articulating the rationale for your project. Why are you doing this? What's important about it? Um, and to identify your collaborators, both the internal collaborators, which could potentially be students, alumni, or external collaborators. So sometimes if you have to take a certain approach where we don't have the equipment or the ability to do so, um, then you might want to identify folks outside Maryland University of Integrative Health. Then you need to design the research methods, and you're going to accept the fact that these are going to change. Um, when you begin, um, oftentimes the process of going through a first iteration reveals things that you didn't think about. So this is just a first start, and you're going to redo it, and you'll learn as you go. And then think about how you're going to collect your data. What's the nature of your data? What do you have to have available for collection? Uh, and that could vary depending on whether you're doing uh, benchtop versus clinical type of work. So our first project was uh, the Lavender Project. And we had a number of partners. This is a project that actually and Dr. Andrew Prangeli, um had started. Um, Krista Lemero was a, a student at the time. She's now a graduate of our program, but is in the nutrition program. And uh, he had started this um, working with Art Tucker. Uh, Dr. Tucker um, was a, a retired professor at Delaware State University. He and Andrew uh, had used methods that Dr. Tucker had developed, and we were writing a monograph for uh, the American Herbal Pharmacopoeia. And this was a, a, a textbook, a microscopy textbook, that they were going to publish as a sister book to a previous publication, which was all on the use of microscopy to characterize botanical medicine. This one will be using microscopy methods to do so. So we had a, a good defined method to begin with. And this is really what we're looking at. We're looking at a, a descriptions of botanical characteristics of the uh, floral elements of lavender that you can see on the left. And in particular, what we're interested in are uh, this um, fertile bract, which is right in the middle. And it points to a brown like leaf structure. And when we look at Lavendula augustifolia, or lavender, what we know as lavender, you can see in that image on the right, the BR is a bract and the BL is a bracteole. And these are going to be important because these are characteristics that we'll use to compare and define species. Because there's an additional species out in the marketplace, Lavendula latifolia or spike. And the cross or the intermediate between those two, the latifolia and the augustifolia, um, which is lavendin. And this is the one that finds its way into commerce as an adulterant. And you can see, again, the bracts and the bracteoles. Now, the method, as defined by Tucker in the citation you see below, um, was using bract length and width ratios. And you can see those provide a range, 0 0.83 to 2.20. Um, and the fact that the bracteoles are either absent or a certain length. And we compare them to the potential adulterant. Uh, but you can see there is actually a little bit of overlay between uh, the intermedia and the augustifolia. So as it turns out, this is the equipment we needed. And pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And this was an alumni-led process, working with uh, students in our QA course. 
the thing that turns out oftentimes in biological research is it refuses to cooperate with us. Just the ratios themselves, uh, there's a, enough overlap that you really have to get a sample size high enough to begin to tease out some of those differences. Um, the other thing that occurred is if we go back to these images, the bracteole, so if we look at this in this region, you have to have a whole bract present. And you have to know what it looks like and what the orientation can be. Because remember, we're getting bags of these uh, plant products from a distributor. They've already been processed. Things are broken, potentially not whole. And the second part of that is the, that defining orientation and appearance for what a complete bract is. When we started doing that, we started to get more consistent ratios that could then be compared. We ran into uh, another problem, which is the supplier began to clean up the bracts through their processing. Now, all of a sudden, you're not getting the very needed elements that we could use to define, is this the lavender that we want, or is this an adultery? So in our second year, we had to actually uh, develop what's called an orthogonal method sensory analysis to identify adulterants. Uh, by orthogonal methods, these are methods that um, aren't uh, exactly like each other. They provide uh, very different data. And so we looked at the known essential oil constituents that help define those two different species and began to uh, train uh, our panelists in the QA course to identify them by smelling lavender, Lavendula augustifolia as a whole extract, the spike as a whole extract, um, aging lavender, so that degradation of some of those compounds uh, would train the nose to pick those up, and then specific essential oils that tend to be more predominant in one species over another. And this really helped in terms of being able to, one, effectively use the method, but also through educational processes, and this includes the identification of what bracts look like, their orientation, etc. What we're doing is ensuring that the findings in other QA labs will be replicable, that these methods for an educated um, lab tech person, um, they'll be able to come up with the same results on a consistent method. And so the, what we'll find now is as we complete this uh, paper with the educational structure as well as the methods and our findings. We're hoping now to submit that to a peer review as well as to the AHP, the American Herbalist, Herbal Pharmacopeia for their microscopy text. So that's the second piece is when you are doing this kind of research, always look for multiple marketplaces in the academic arena where you might share your findings. Uh, our second project was a microbiology project. and. Uh, for those of you that remember your microbiology, this will bring back potentially fond memories. I hope they do. Our partners in this project were uh, three graduates of our program, Joanne Gibbons, Nicole Rubin, Mary Beth Macenda. Joanne Gibbons um, is our incredible GMP compliance officer, worked on a Emerson grant to bring the dispensary into uh, GMP compliance. And these projects emerged out of that grant process. Nicole Rubin is our manager of the dispensary, and she also was a partner with Joanne in developing these GMPs for both the dispensary, but also in terms of training our students to understand GMP requirements in a manufacturing environment. Mary Beth Masenda has sort of led our uh, ePortfolio and internship program, and she is very much involved in finding, uh, placing students in internships with Joanne and with Nikki in the dispensary. Um, we had external partners, um, Dr. Jane Dubois and Dr. Angela Winslow, both at GIFSAN, Joint Institute of Food Safety and Nutrition. This is a partnership between the University of Maryland and the FDA uh, down at College Park. Um, Jane Dubois is the lab manager and Angela Winslow is the microbiologist. And what we did really is we looked to detect microbial contamination in several different echinacea tinctures. Um, the 45% um, alcohol uh, extract of Augustifolia and the 95% uh, 
extract of Augusta folia. Both were, were done in the dispensary. The 60% alcohol extract of E. purpurea seed, aerial, and Augusta folia root with a product by Gaia Herbs. And we wanted to look at different plant parts, uh, different species, as well as different alcohol contents. Just because we have an example where in GMP environments, um, we need to test extracts, any product for microbial growth. Um, what we know is that 70% alcohol is used as a septic technique to kill microbes in the lab. But the data is lacking when it comes to how far down in concentration can we take the alcohol and still prevent microbial contamination. What we're looking for is um, we need to address these issues for GMP compliance, and smaller companies do. And a lot of these efforts are based on the fact that we want to support the smaller companies who are struggling with some of the GMP compliance requirements. They're the lifeblood of the industry. They're the innovators. Um, we've got our own students coming out. We want them to be well-versed in being able to take approaches that FDA accepts um, and don't require huge investments. So the idea is that we produce peer-reviewed data. Smaller companies then can refer to that in the published literature uh, when they make rational choices in meeting GMP requirements. So our equipment was simple. The, it turns out um, that nowadays uh, 3M has very simple plates that can be used that have already been set up to either, um, in this case, look at uh, coliform aerobic count plates or mold and yeast plates. Or you can go old school. Uh, and this is where we bring in graduate students right, to do all the grunt work in pouring plates and preparing them and inoculating them and then counting the surface colonies. And the way we did that is just to go ahead and in year one, note the amount of growth, it's somewhat subjective, not uh, quantitative. Um, and you can see that we have different types of samples. We have dried purpurea and Augustifolia root, dried purpurea flower, and fresh I guess the folia root, as well as the extracts. And we were really sort of eyeballing and um, comparing the amount of growth that we saw on them. Um, and what turns out is that the, um, the product where it was just the root or flower material without any alcohol, we tended to have higher growth there, particularly at their lower dilution rates. So 10 to the one, 10 to the negative two, 10 to the negative three, those are increasing dilutions, meaning there's less and less of the material present. Um, and obviously the fresh material had the greatest growth. And we can see that uh, for the most part, uh, there was very little growth in the 45 and 95% um, and a little bit of growth on the 25% fresh material. So the challenge was that um, we had students and alumni as both experimenters with GIF sand personnel training them. And we needed to have a better method to quantitate. We want to report data, we want to report useful data, we want to report it in a manner that's acceptable in the field. We also need to ensure better septic working conditions. In the GIF sand labs, they uh, had been working on bench tops, not in hoods, which is traditional. A hood would be a contained space that allows egress. Uh, uh, for a lab personnel with their hands, put their faces behind a, a, a plastic uh, divider, and there's a negative airflow, so it prevents contaminants from getting in there. But instead, we were working on the bench tops because they said it was an aseptic place uh, based on filtration and air movement. It turned out that some of their filters hadn't been changed lately, and so we didn't have an aseptic workplace. But we'll come back to that because we did it again with the changes to the filtration, and we'll see some different results. Um, we needed a sim to simplify our sample diversity because the greater that diversity with the, with the requirements for the number of samples of each that you have to take to get statistically significant numbers, it was going to become a little bit more unwieldy. And the other thing that we needed to do was really improve um, the folks who were doing this methodology and producing the results had been trained well in aseptic techniques. Aseptic techniques being how do you 
handle the material in such a way that you're not introducing contaminants in breathing into it, in um, dropping material into it. Um, so there's a whole process that we uh, went through in our second attempt where we had much better training and we had better results because of that. So our approach to the quantifying was to look at this uh, method called serial dilution which we saw we did uh, in the first one as well. But in this one, we really took it to the point where we could quantitate. So you can see that you have an initial sample. You take um, uh, 10 mils of that sample and you dilute it with 90 mils of an inert buffer. And as you keep doing that, you're getting smaller and smaller amounts of the original material. And when you put those on these Petri dishes or plates, you can see in the first one what we call them the mother tincture, um, that the number of small dots or areas of growth, or colony forming units, are much greater than can be counted accurately. Uh, in that second dilution, that is uh, an accurate count plate. Um, there's a certain level of colony forming units at which you uh, say uh, it's countable, or if it falls below that at a certain dilution level, um, even though it might be present it's still reported as zero. And this is the simple math. For those of you that are math geeks and want to follow up on that, uh, remember if you want to do that, pause the video. And um, these are some of the results. So most of the growth came from the 60 and 95 percent preparations, but all were below the accountable number of 10 at a certain dilution rate. So there's the left hand side, the mold plate, the petri dish, and the aerobic plate. Uh, these are all, uh, I think these are 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 1, 10 to the negative 2 in dilutions. So we would report those as zero. Now our plans for the third year is in discussing uh, aseptic conditions with Dr. Angela Winslow at GIFSAN. She noted that uh, there is a process for using Bunsen burners to create a sterile air column. If we or in the dispensary, or if someone is in a small business, if they can create a, a sterile workplace, a, a bench top, and they can use a Bunsen burner to create a, a sterile columnar space, they use proper aseptic techniques and they work within the confines of that space, we should be able to do the microbiology in a very simple manner. So we're going to repeat those processes using a Bunsen burner both at GIFSAN and at the dispensary. And um, this really is uh, to help get data to show that a small producer could use this method, low cost method, and produce uh, sufficiently uh, rigorous results so that they can depend on them. So thoughts on best practice from the faculty point of view. I'm gonna suggest you identify real needs in your field even if they seem small, because we really want to be of service. We want to train our students uh, to be of service to a larger field and to include those students in the project, either via a course or a practicum, and that they should be exploring unanswered questions because it's in that unanswered questions that the process of inquiry really gets developed. And this is a place where you as a mentor can help guide them into greater complexity and questions that lead to better questions as opposed to answers. Um, what I've done and I would suggest doing is to include alumni as guest lecturers who know the material a little bit better um, and can actually help you develop the material. And this is a way of engaging them in complex inquiry beyond what they experience as a student. From the student point of view is the question, does the project succeed as an experiment? So what does that mean? Well, in many respects, you can run experiments that don't succeed in producing the data that you think uh, it would. It doesn't end up supporting a hypothesis. It means that you've done something, but there's nothing that comes out of it that's publishable. But for the students, two outcomes can ensure that no matter what the experiment ends up, that the students will succeed. And that is that you want them to acquire effective skills for the field that they're in. If they're doing that 
and they're building networks by interacting with external collaborators, then they are succeeding. This turns out to be very effective for them. And so my question then is, can we impart wisdom and what does that look like? Now, I had I've struggled with that verb impart. What is it that we're actually doing? Uh, are, we, are we offering? Are we cultivating? Um, maybe that's a better word. But still the idea of what is it that wisdom looks like? And I'm going to suggest from my point of view and the kinds of experiments that I do, what it might look like. Here's a typical um, sort of definition as we climb up the ladder from data to information to knowledge. And I've got a question mark there for the wisdom piece. And I'll answer that and suggest if what I provide makes sense to you, please adopt it. If not, continue to explore on your own. Um, but an inquiry-based project, it starts with loving the interesting question. Inquiry is about the refinement of questions so that you can work off of what others have left behind, provide additional data to help move the field, and ideally, more interesting questions for others to pick up to build off of what you did. Secondly, I'm going to suggest that what you do with your students is encourage them to follow their curiosity into their discomfort. Originally, I'd used the word fear here, and some people thought, well, that might turn off students. But really, what we're saying is inquiry can lead to discomfort because it's usually complex data. It's messy data if you're dealing with biology in any form. And you have to be able to accept the fact that there's going to be some discomfort associated with that process. But to put more weight on that spark of curiosity that brought you there in the first place and allow that to be the light that takes you into that darkness of unknowing and discomfort. And I'll ask you this, what if there are no answers? Let's go back to those first three questions. It turns out these three questions have not been answered. Originally, they thought they had answers for all of them, and it turns out they're not sufficient. So if there are no answers, will your questioning still be fun? I think you have to model that as faculty and students. You need to engage in that, that the attempt to answer questions in and of itself is play. And it's a wonderful way to engage the mind. And it's a talent and a skill that will see you into a number of different opportunities. And finally, with that play, risk delight. Simple delight at the process, at what you're finding out, trying to structure the process so that you can get answers that are definable and that can be offered and presented in a, in a forum of your peers. So I'll leave you with this. This is a plant monotropa uniflora, or ghost pipe. It's a mycoparasite, meaning it does not produce its own chlorophyll. You can see that it uh, lacks that green color. It taps into the mycorrhizal network underground to get its sugars, things that would only be produced internally through the process of photosynthesis. And with that, it draws all kinds of secondary metabolites or phytochemicals that we can use as medicine. It's a plant that's in a very delicate environment. It can easily be destroyed. And so in some ways, although it's a wonderful medicine, um, particularly for pain, both physical and psychological, that, that place where you are disembodied from your own self, from your own body, PTSD is an example of this. Um, this has been used oftentimes in old school concert where people were using hallucinogens and had lost contact with self to help guide them back. Uh, so it, it's really a wonderful medicine, but yet it's also a very, very delicate medicine. And so I'll leave you with this example of delight. This poem is entitled, The World You See Is Not Your Own. Ghost pipe whispers like blood edging taut across the skin of my temple driving faded echoes up into forest elders as they burst into canopy light a dense mat of leaf decay gives way slowly to something approximating smoke diffuse 
and ethereal beings that weave moments into memory, unravels story into that which waits outside me for her dusky breath, her brain stem sway. Keep this vertical space alive in your heart, open to the pulse of mycelial filament, stretched thin inside human voice. Stay connected. With that, I want to thank you. And I want to express my gratitude um, since this is a talk that was given as part of the um, research symposium and uh, for the award uh, from the Research and Scholarship Award Committee here. Um, for my mentors, Dr. George Bean and Dr. Joseph Betts, both uh, very different, but uh, both equally important in terms of my development as a scientist, as a thinker. And my collaborators, Dr. Andrew Bengali, Dr. Arthur Tucker, uh, Krista Lamoureux, Joanne Gibbons, Nicole Rubin, um, the committee and uh, the wonderful herb team. Uh, Herbies uh, were wonderful and uh, I'm glad I'm part of them. Thank you.